Well, I do want to talk about Van Til, though. I want to focus on Van Til, and of course, uh, Van Til was my teacher in uh, apologetics, and I learned a lot of philosophy from him. I learned a lot of theology from him. Uh, and you see there on 247 his dates, uh, 1895 to 1987. So uh, he and Clark uh, died, died in the same decade. They were Van Til was a little older, but they were roughly of the same generation. Uh, Van Til is Bible believing. He's Reformed. Uh, he grew up in the well. He was born in the Netherlands. Uh, his family came over uh, to live in Michigan, one of the Dutch colonies in Michigan, and they became farmers, dairy people, and uh, Cornelius, uh, uh, they, they became members of the Christian Reformed Church, excuse me. Um, they became members of the Christian Reformed Church, and uh, uh, Van Til began his education uh, in the uh, Christian school system. Uh, of course, the uh, Christian Reformed Church people have their uh, Christian schools. Uh, it's an inheritance from Abraham Kuyper. And uh, so uh, Van Til was educated in Christian schools and in Calvin College. And uh, he went for a time to Calvin Seminary. Uh, and then he transferred from Calvin Seminary to Princeton Seminary, where he uh, got uh, acquainted with J. Gresham Machen, for example. Uh, Gerhardus Voss, a fellow Dutchman, was a great friend of his. And uh, so he uh, studied at Princeton, got his degree there, also got a PhD from Princeton University while he was uh, in the area. And then he began to uh, teach theology at Princeton Seminary. Uh, but after Princeton Seminary was reorganized by the denomination, to uh, so that it would be uh, uh, so that it would include uh, professors who held liberal views, uh, Van Til didn't want to teach it there anymore. He went back to Michigan to become a pastor. But after a year uh, or so, uh, J. Gresham Machen uh, uh, persuaded him. <laughs> Through, through very persistent uh, persuasion, persuaded Van Til to come and join the faculty of Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, and he taught there um, until uh, his retirement and uh, uh, stayed in the area until he died in 1987. A very reformed, very much committed to uh, Calvinism, uh, very much committed to the Reformed confessions. Van Til... Uh, always began with the doctrine of creation. Uh, <clears throat> Van Til and Clark have their own pedagogy. Clark likes to begin with the uh, uh, ref refutation of empiricism. Uh, Van Til uh, likes to begin with creation. He would come into class every day, put two circles on the blackboard, an upper circle and a lower circle. And uh, the upper circle, which was larger, the upper circle represented God. The lower circle represented the creation. And so he pointed out to all of us that the, uh, the Christian worldview is a two-level worldview. We don't believe that there's one single reality. We believe there are two distinct levels of reality which should not be confused with one another. If you've read any of Peter Jones's books recently, and Peter is a good friend of mine, uh, if you've read any of Peter Jones's books recently, uh, Peter likes to make the distinction between one-ism and two-ism. Uh, two-ism is orthodox Christianity, believing in two levels of reality that should not be confused. One-ism is the view of Eastern religions, the view of uh, uh, New Age philosophy, the view of new paganism, which uh, uh, has uh, influenced our society uh, a great deal. Uh, the idea that there's only one kind of reality, that uh, uh, everybody is, is really one at bottom, and that we should bring everybody together in an indistinguishable mass. Uh, Peter makes some very interesting points based on that contrast, and I would uh, suggest that you read uh, some of his books. Uh, um, one-ism comes from uh, 
a worldview very much like ancient Gnosticism. Uh, Two-ism is the view of, of uh, Orthodox Christianity. Well, says uh, Van Til, uh, God created the world out of nothing. And he governs everything by his eternal plan. And what that means is that all facts, every fact in the world, is a fact that has been pre-interpreted by God. That is to say, every fact is a God-made fact, a God-determined fact. It's part of God's eternal plan. So there is no such thing as a brute fact. A brute fact is an uninterpreted fact. A brute fact is something that is just there that begs for man to give the first interpretation. No, everything has already been interpreted by God. So as we go through the world trying to understand the world, trying to interpret the world, uh, what we want to do is to give a secondary interpretation, a reinterpretation of God's primary interpretation. So uh, just as there are two levels of reality, the level of the creator and the level of the creature, there are two kinds of interpretation. There's the original interpretation of God, and then there's the reinterpretation which we uh, engage in. And the goal, of course, is for our reinterpretation to agree with God's primary interpretation. Uh, this universe, the created world, consists of facts and laws. Uh, there are facts in the world, and then there are laws, which are the ways in which the facts uh, move around and relate to one another, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are no facts without laws. There are no laws without facts. Uh, neither one exists without the other. Uh, because, of course, the laws are God's interpretations in the final analysis. So there is no fact apart from God's interpretation. There's no fact apart from God's laws. The world is one and many in analogy with the Trinity, okay? But there's, you never have one without many, and you never have many without one. Now, some philosophers... Uh, as you remember, uh, have gone around trying to find the ultimate oneness of the world. Parmenides is an example of that. Spinoza is an example of that. Hegel is an example of that. Finding the one, what, what unites everything together. Uh, New Age philosophy, Peter's uh, uh, point of contrast, Plotinus, the Gnostics, all trying to find a one that brings everything together. Uh, other people, like the atomists, for example, or Leibniz, try to chop everything up into tiny little, little chunks so that we can find the ultimate many, the ultimate plurality that explains everything. But what Van Til says is you never have an ultimate many and you never find an ultimate one. You never find a one without manyness and you never find a many without oneness. When you try to do either one of those things, uh, you are trying to have an exhaustive knowledge of the world without God. You're trying to understand the world by some kind of pantheistic oneness without asking what God says. Or you're trying to understand the world through understanding all these tiny constituents of the world without asking what God says. And you can't do that. There is no uh, you cannot understand the small constituents without the oneness that joins them together. And you can't understand the oneness without the many that differentiates it and defines it. So uh, uh, oneness and manyness uh, in uh, analogy with the Trinity. Uh, realism versus nominalism. Re remember, a realist says uh, that uh, uh, the uh, uh, forms or the universal terms are, are real entities, uh, and uh, the, the nominalist thinks that there are no general terms, there are no general objects, there are only these little tiny uh, specifics or particulars. Again, uh, no, uh, in, in Van Til's philosophy, no 
uh, realism without nominalism, no uh, uh, generals without particulars, no particulars that are not united uh, in generals. Uh, and that's because God is himself, both one and many. Now, all knowledge, according to Van Til, is analogous. Uh, where have we heard that before? Well, Thomas Aquinas said something like that. Uh, Thomas Aquinas said that the language we use about God is neither univocal nor equivocal, but analogous. Uh, Van Til uh, discusses Aquinas in that respect and uh, talks about the problem uh, of language. How can we talk about God univocally, um, equivocally, or analogically? I think Van Til ends up agreeing with Thomas Aquinas, although he doesn't quite say so. And I think Van Til actually allows for some very literal language about God, as, as uh, Gordon Clark, of course, would insist on literal language that we have about God. But Van Til uh, uh, was not much concerned about that problem. He was not much concerned about the language we use uh, concerning God. Uh, he was more interested in the question of the analogy of being, uh, the, the uh, uh, similarity between God and the world, uh, the, uh, uh, relation, the general relationship between God and the world. And, uh, and, and analogical knowledge, according to Van Til, is not thinking in non-literal language. For Van Til, analogical knowledge is thinking God's thoughts after him. And what does that mean? That means thinking according to the Christian revelation. So for Van Til, it's not a matter of language. Uh, that, that's only a very peripheral interest of Van Til. Uh, it's not thinking according to uh, whether language is literal or non-literal or not. The, the question of analogy is, do we think according to Scripture or not? Do we think according to God's revelation or not? Now, in Van Til's view, uh, our thoughts are never identical to God's, uh, contrary to Clark. God's thoughts are original, and ours are derivative. I mean, just think, whatever God thinks about an apple, uh, his thought about the apple is the original thought about the apple. In fact, God makes apples according to his own thoughts. His thoughts come before the apples themselves. So uh, God's uh, thoughts uh, are, uh, are original, uh, ours are derivative. We get our thoughts of apples from the uh, uh, apples that God has made. Uh, so uh, God's thought about the apple is different from ours. God's thoughts have divine attributes. His thoughts are in eternal, infinite, omniscient, while ours are not. And God, I think this is fairly important, God's subjective experience of thinking is very different from ours. Uh, as Clark said, uh, God... Uh, uh, knows everything as an eternal intuition, whereas we have to, we have to accumulate knowledge uh, through a temporal sequence. Uh, four, we are called to think as servants and subject to one another. In, I'm sorry, in subjection uh, to God. Uh, God thinks as Lord in subjection to no one. But in my view, God uh, Van Til does not deny that God and man can affirm the same propositions, though Clark accused him of holding that view. In fact, uh, Van Til, in his introduction to systematic theology, says very clearly, uh, two plus two is four is a well-known fact. God knows it. Man knows it. So he affirms that uh, God and man uh, do know the same propositions. So I don't think Van Til and Clark are that different from one another. Uh, really, uh, although they certainly thought they were. But in any case, uh, uh, Van Til does say that our thinking is analogical in the sense that it's uh, subsequent to God's revelation. God doesn't have to have anything revealed to him. Uh, we do. Uh, that, this leads to thoughts about 
systematic theology, systematic thinking. Uh, you remember how Clark uh, said that uh, uh, theology is like geometry. You, you have a system. You come up with axioms and you deduce consequences from those axioms. Uh, Van Til affirms also the use of logic in developing a system of thought. But because God is incomprehensible, he says there are apparent contradictions in Revelation that we may not be able to resolve, such as the goodness of God and the reality of evil, uh, such as divine sovereignty and human responsibility. And these should motivate caution in our logical deductions. We should constantly look at the explicit teachings of Scripture, lest our deductions lead us into conflict with God's revelation. So Van Til kind of warns us against dangers in logic. Clark would never do that. <laughs> when Clark hears Van Til talking that way, he says, Oh, Van Til, you're disparaging logic. Uh, logic is a wonderful gift that God has given us of his own mind, and so on and so forth. So you, you see the, the two men were very much at odds with one another uh, in, in their emphasis and their personality and the things they thought were most important, too. But uh, I think Van Til uh, has, has some, some truth here. I, I think that logic, of course... Uh, uh, is a wonderful gift that we have from God, but uh, we make mistakes in logic, and we, we don't know that uh, uh, the logical deductions that we make are exactly the same that God would make if God were incarnate uh, uh, along with us here today. Now, presuppositions, section D in the outline, Van Til uh, believes, as Clark does, that uh, human thought is subject to presuppositions. Van Til is not an a priorist in the sense of disparaging empirical knowledge or a posteriori knowledge. Uh, Clark is, uh, uh, disparages the a posteriori and uh, glorifies the a priori. Uh, Van Til does not do that, and uh, uh, if you think that uh, because Van Til is a presuppositionalist, he has to uh, disparage the a posteriori, that, that's not, just not true. But as indicated above, Van Til insisted on the correlativity between facts and logic. But Van Til did maintain that God's word has absolute authority over all aspects of human life, including thinking and reasoning. So our knowledge of scripture must govern our understanding of everything else. This must be the case even when we are witnessing to non-Christians. I remember Van Til was a professor of apologetics, and so he's particularly concerned about apologetic encounters. Uh, so uh, what happens when we meet a, a non-Christian and he doesn't share our presuppositions? Does that mean we should abandon our presuppositions so as to be have common ground uh, with the non-Christian? Uh, no, says Van Til. Even when we're witnessing to non-Christians, especially when we're witnessing to non-Christians, we must maintain our presupposition. Otherwise, uh, what we're presenting to him is not a consistent witness. What is a presupposition? Well, Van Til, I think, never defined it. But uh, what I have here in the outline is my own definition, uh, which... Uh, follows Van Til. I think it, it uh, reflects Van Til's own usage. A presupposition may be defined as a belief that takes precedence over other beliefs. An ultimate presupposition is one that takes precedence over all ultimate beliefs. That is, it's a basic commitment of one's heart. So uh, our belief in the Bible, our belief in God, is a belief that uh, uh, we hold to uh, despite uh, any belief that might be inconsistent with it. So belief in God, belief in the Bible prevails over against uh, uh, any, uh, uh, any kind of uh, attempt to, uh, uh, to rebut or to uh, uh, defeat. Uh, see how different this is from planting as the uh, idea of a basic belief. Uh, 
the top of 249, let's think about evidence. Now, people often say Van Til is a presuppositionalist. And so uh, when we talk to an unbeliever, when we have an apologetic encounter with an unbeliever, um, we're not allowed to use evidence. We just uh, exchange presuppositions. Now, that's not Van Til's view. Uh, Van Til does not deny the importance of using evidence to verify the truth of Christianity. As a matter of fact, he, uh, uh, he thinks that uh, evidence is very important. Uh, but that evidence must be used, he says, in a biblical way, not as brute fact, but as facts created and directed by God. In other words, uh, I, I point to a fact to the non-Christian. I don't say that's a brute fact. I say that fact is what God has made it to be. And that, of course, in a way, is what Clark was urging. I mean, Clark uh, says we, we shouldn't point to the fact of the resurrection apart from its meaning. We shouldn't point to the, uh, to the miracles apart from their interpretation. Uh, the miracles aren't just brute facts. The miracles are what they are in a framework of interpretation. Same for the resurrection, same for all Christian evidences. Uh, well, if we say that we can't use evidence apart from uh, uh, the presuppositions of the, of the gospel, sorry, I'm not keeping up with you here. The uh, people sometimes say that uh, if we think, uh, if we direct our apologetic according to our authoritative biblical presuppositions, that introduces circularity into apologetic argument. That is, I'm saying I want you to believe in Christ uh, because I'm presupposing belief in Christ. Uh, the syllogism would look like this. Uh, uh, Christ is Lord. Uh, uh, scripture is God's word. Therefore, Christ is Lord. <laughs> or Scripture says that Christ is Lord. Therefore, Christ is Lord. Uh, an argument that looks kind of circular. Well, we, uh, Van Til kind of admits to being circular in one way, but uh, uh, we have to listen to him carefully as to what he's saying here. Uh, Van Til says that circularity is warranted at one point, and that is when we are arguing for God, the very criterion of truth, now, what Van Til says is that every argument is circular in one sense. And every system, uh, Christian, non-Christian, whatever, all systems uh, are circular because all systems are dependent on presuppositions. And all systems, in order to prove those presuppositions, in order to argue those presuppositions, have to appeal to those presuppositions. I'll show you what I mean. If I'm a rationalist, let's say, uh, like Descartes or Spinoza, and I'm trying to prove to you that you should be a rationalist too, you should believe that reason uh, is the ultimate authority, how do I prove that? Well, the only way I can do it is by presenting you with a rational argument. That is, I appeal to reason in order to prove reason. So there's a circularity there. If I'm an empiricist, and I'm trying to persuade you that sense experience is the foundation of human knowledge, how do I argue that? Well, uh, ultimately, if you keep challenging me, I have to appeal to sense experience. Now, most empiricists don't do that. It's not very plausible uh, to try to argue for empiricism on the basis of empiricism. Uh, but uh, I have to do that in order to be consistent if I really believe that sense experience is the basic, uh, is the basic, uh, is the basis of all human knowledge, then uh, I, I can't uh, deny that when I'm arguing with a non-believer. I have to assume that that's true, and if necessary, I have to appeal to uh, sense experience in order to prove sense experience. So, um, the uh, uh, first answer to this uh, objection that uh, the argument is circular is that everybody is in the same boat. The uh, non-Christian is in the same boat 
uh, that we are in. Now, does this just lead to a standoff? Does this just lead to, uh, uh, I throw my presupposition at him, and he throws his presupposition at me, and we never get any f anywhere? Uh, I bat his away with mine, and he bats mine away with his, and uh, we never uh, can ever come to an agreement. Uh, another way of asking that question is by asking, can such circular arguments ever be persuasive? And the answer to that, and this is Van Til's answer, first, yes, these arguments can be persuasive, because this is the way God intended for our minds to think. Okay, God made our minds to think on the presupposition of his revelation. And so we can't help thinking that way. And if the non-Christian is, uh, the non-Christian's mind too is made to think according to the theistic presupposition. And so uh, uh, he will always find a tension if he tries to uh, think according to uh, a non-biblical presupposition, he'll always feel tension there. He'll always find a, feel an awkwardness there. Uh, and he won't be able to, uh, uh, to have uh, any kind of cognitive rest or cognitive peace uh, in his deliberations. But another point uh, that Van Til makes sometimes, and I, I make this point with the terms narrowly and broadly, uh, there's a difference between a narrowly circular argument and a broadly circular argument. In a narrowly circular argument, uh, I would say, for example, God exists because God exists, or the Bible is the word of God because the Bible is the word of God. Well, that's a narrowly circular argument. Uh, it's a valid argument, by the way, because the uh, conclusion really follows from the premise. And it's a sound argument, I would say, because the premise is true and therefore the conclusion is true, valid and sound, but not persuasive. Every argument ha has to, uh, a good argument has to have three qualities. It has to be valid, logically valid, it has to be sound, that means having true premises, and it has to be persuasive. And uh, in a narrowly circular argument, we have an argument that's valid and an argument that's sound, but not an argument that's persuasive. Well, how do we make it persuasive? By broadening the circle. Uh, how do we broaden the circle? We do that by bringing in facts and evidences, such as archaeological discoveries support the re reliability of the Book of Acts. Even liberal scholars have sometimes said that, that Luke is a remarkably accurate historian. Now, of course, uh, when we uh, explain that, and he'll say, well, what uh, archaeology are you talking about? What facts uh, have the archaeologists discovered? And so on and so forth. And uh, in doing that, we have to uh, analyze the archaeological data not the way Rudolf Bultmann does, <laughs> uh, not the way... Uh, uh, not the way Nietzsche does, but uh, in accord with a biblical worldview. In other words, we bring our presupposition to bear on the very analysis of the evidence. So the argument is still circular. But bringing the facts into the argument uh, broadens the circle and makes the argument somewhat more persuasive. The inquirer uh, sees that... Uh, uh, this way of uh, thinking, this Christian presupposition, is able to give a good account, a plausible account of the facts, of the data. And so uh, he is more inclined uh, to believe than uh, otherwise. Now, of course, we have to recognize that uh, uh, faith comes only by uh, the hearing of the Word of God, and the hearing of the Word of God comes only through the Holy Spirit. So conversion is a supernatural event in any case. Uh, whatever we do is not going to uh, be any guarantee uh, that a person will be converted. But uh, anyway, it is uh, uh, useful, I think, rhetorically and uh, logically, argumentatively, to uh, bring more content into the circle. Uh, at the very least, what we're doing is we're 
presenting the, the non-Christian with more and more divine revelation, more and more of the Word of God, more and more of the glory of God seen in the creation. And that can't help but be an advantage uh, if God uh, pleases to use that kind of argument. Well, now, uh, that's the, the basic uh, thrust of Van Til's apologetics. Now, it's important that we keep in mind that uh, Van Til believes that uh, uh, human sin has to be accounted for. Now, Gordon Clark doesn't say very much about how human sin is to be dealt with in apologetics. But Van Til does, and Van Til recognizes that uh, non-believers, because of their sin, resist God's revelation. He puts a lot of emphasis on Romans 1. And in Romans 1, the unbeliever knows God clearly. All right? So the unbeliever should not present, be presented as somebody who is ignorant. Uh, he knows that God exists because God has shown him that God exists. But he represses the truth in unrighteousness, according to Romans 1, verse 18. He represses the truth in unrighteousness. He exchanges it for a lie, it says later on. That's the noetic effects of sin. That's what sin does with God's revelation. That's what sin does with the mind. Now, so many people are reluctant to believe that sin affects the mind, you know. Uh, we, we're very quick to recognize that sin affects the way we deal with money and with sex and with culture and with entertainment and so on and so forth. But we hesitate to think that sin also deals with the way we think, the way we reason, the kinds of systems that we, that we ascribe to. And Van Til is very good here. He's very good at helping us to see how sin uh, affects uh, our thought. Well, so a scripture often emphasizes the antithesis between the wisdom of the world and the truth of God. As all these unbelievers are repressing the truth and unrighteousness, they tend to favor uh, worldviews and philosophies which are against God, which deny God's revelation. So uh, the, the great trends of, of non-believing thought, the philosophies of the Greeks and all of the uh, philosophies of unbelief, uh, these thoughts are the result of human beings uh, repressing the truth of God, exchanging it for a lie. Uh, well, Scripture emphasizes antithesis between these. Uh, these are opposite to one another. These are fighting one another. The wisdom of the world versus the truth of God. 1 Corinthians, for example, uh, chapters 1 through 3. Uh, how can we believe that, antithesis, and also believe in Kuiper's doctrine of common grace? Uh, <laughs> Kuiper fought this through himself, you know, in, in his encyclopedia of sacred theology, he said there are two types of people, meaning two types of science. And there are those who are regenerate and those who are unregenerate. And there is com conflict between the two. And so he had a hard time defining how it is that people who are regenerate can work together in culture and politics and business and so on. How can we work together with those who are not born again? That's a major problem in Kuiper. Uh, he seems to have come to different answers at different times. We need our own schools, but nevertheless, we, uh, we need to work together in businesses and things like that. Uh, so Kuiper wrote four volumes on common grace, and eventually somebody will translate it, and I'll figure out what Kuiper had to say about that. But uh, anyway, Van Til, who's very much a disciple of Kuiper, uh, Van Til had to work that, to, uh, work that through on his own. Uh, there is an antithesis between believer and unbeliever, but nevertheless, there is also common grace, so that uh, uh, when the unbeliever says the sky is blue, the believer can agree with him, okay? Uh, the antithesis is absolute in principle, 
because believer and unbeliever have different masters. The unbeliever uh, bows before Satan uh, and opposes the truth of God, even though he knows at some level that that is true. Uh, this is, uh, by the way, almost the definition of irrationalism. Uh, fighting against God, even though you know that God is, is true and God is the most powerful. Imagine Satan. We, we picture in our minds uh, Satan as a very intelligent foe. But Satan uh, chose to, Satan knows God, Satan knows God's powers, Satan knows the Son of God, Satan knows something about God's plan. Certainly Satan knows that any, anyone who opposes God is going to be defeated. And yet Satan opposes God anyway. Isn't that amazing? Satan is the very definition of irrationality irrationalism um, so uh, uh, but but nevertheless Satan also has some truth doesn't he he knows some things uh, the devils uh, when Jesus casts devils out of people they admit that God is one and they admit that Jesus Christ is the Holy One of God uh, the Pharisees uh, Jesus says that they're sons and daughters of the devil but they were relatively Orthodox Old Testament believers so uh, we have the principle of antithesis and we have the principle of common grace. And how do we make these two things work together? Uh, that's a real problem for Van Til. Uh, and uh, he tries various ways of formulating the antithesis. I discuss these in some detail in my book called Van Til... Uh, Van Til, an analysis of his thought. Cornelius Van Til, an analysis of his thought. Forgot the title of my own book there for a moment. It's getting late in the day, <laughs> as well as late in the course. Uh, Van Til tries various ways of formulating the antithesis, which I judge at least to be inadequate. He says, for example, at one point, that the unbeliever is obligated to know God, but he doesn't actually know God. I think that's wrong. I, I say that respectfully. I respect Van Til, but at that point I disagree with him. I think Van Til is, is wrong because Romans 1.21 says that the unbeliever is not just obligated to know God, he actually does know God. Number two, here's another way of formulating the antithesis. The unbeliever is in contact with God's revelation but he interprets it wrongly. He's in contact, but his interpretations are wrong. But that can't be right, because Scripture presents Satan and unbelievers as making true statements, that is, interpreting things rightly. Uh, I know who you are, say, say the demons, the Holy One of God. That's a true interpretation. Another thing Van Til says is that the unbeliever knows God in a formal sense, but not in a, I guess, a material sense. I'm not sure what formal is opposed to here, but uh, I don't understand the meaning of what Van Til is saying at that point. Or fourthly, the unbeliever knows God but doesn't love him. I think that's better. I think that actually draws on some biblical themes. But uh, I wouldn't want to say that the unbeliever's uh, intellectual knowledge is perfectly okay while his love of God is defective. I think his intellectual knowledge is affected by sin too. So I, I think that, uh, you know, Van Til demonstrates it's very difficult uh, to reconcile the antithesis with common grace. My own view is that there is no truth that the unbeliever cannot utter. Uh, the unbeliever can know that God exists. The unbeliever can know that God is one and state that God is one, as James says. And the unbeliever can uh, say that Jesus is the Son of God. And the unbeliever can uh, uh, say that the Bible is the Word of God. So it's not that there's a certain content 
that there's a certain proposition that the uh, unbeliever doesn't know. Rather, the, the antithesis is to be found first in the unbeliever's overall project. He joins Satan to try to overthrow God's sovereignty. And that, as I said, is totally irrational, but that infects his thinking in many ways. He's got this contradiction in his life, uh, trying to overthrow God, uh, and uh, while at the same time recognizing that God is Lord. And that contradiction uh, is going to appear in a lot of the things that he says and a lot of the things that he does. But you can never quite predict uh, when he's going to say something truly and when he's going to say something that's uh, deceitful. Secondly, uh, the unbeliever's consistent purpose is that of attacking the truth of God, both in his own consciousness in others and in society. So in that way, the unbeliever is trying very hard to be consistent, uh, whether he's able to do that or not. This leads, this antithesis leads uh, the unbeliever uh, into rationalism and irrationalism. As a result of sin, the unbeliever tries to combine belief in his intellectual self-sufficiency, that is rationalism, with belief that there is no ultimate rationality to the world, and that is irrationalism. We've talked about that often before in this course. And Van Til uses this as a pattern for analyzing the history of philosophy. Uh, and we've used that here through this course to, say, to see that uh, in most every philosopher uh, that's not influenced by the gospel, most every philosopher, uh, you have an attempt to, rec uh, to reconcile rationalism with irrationalism. You have some fairly pure examples of rationalism like Parmenides and Plotinus and Spinoza and Hegel. You have some fairly pure examples of irrationalism, like the Sophists, uh, like Nietzsche, uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, like, uh, 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 like the, uh, well, uh, like many people today who just don't believe there is any truth to be found, uh, relativism uh, among people today. And yet, for most of the greater philosophers, you have both rationalism and irrationalism. For Plato, you have rationalism in the world of forms. You have irrationalism in the world of experience. Uh, for Aristotle, you have uh, uh, rational form again. as the rational principle. Matter is the irrational principle. Uh, in Kant, uh, uh, the phenomena are rational, the noumenal, are, are not rational, uh, and, and so on you go um, through the history of philosophy. I think that's a very fruitful way of understanding the history of philosophy. Uh, the whole general picture of, uh, of philosophy from the Greeks through the medievals through uh, uh, the modern period just uh, started lighting up when I, when I looked at it that way. Van Til's apologetic First, he opposes what he calls the traditional method in apologetics, he, uh, such as the method of Aquinas. Butler uh, also, he often refers to the Aquinas-Butler method. The traditional method, he says, uh, assumes human intellectual autonomy, and it fails to presuppose God's revelation, sometimes for fear of circularity and it assumes that the world is intelligible apart from God and fur furnishes premises by which God's revelation can be proved true. Another argument he has against traditional apologetics is that in traditional apologetics, particularly Butler, uh, Butler, for example, argues that Christianity is probable, not certainly true. Uh, Van Til thinks that uh, uh, Butler, when he says this, is uh, denying the clarity of God's revelation. Now, I don't agree with Van Til here. I think a claim of probability uh, sometimes is appropriate in apologetics. It may be taken simply as an admission of the limitations of the apologist's own argument uh, rather than uh, 
uh, saying that the evidence is unclear. The evidence is clear, but our formulation of the evidence into arguments is not necessarily clear. Um, now, I, I think that Van Til is correct to find these errors in much of the apologetic tradition. But I think that in the apologetic tradition and in the philosophical tradition, as we re review what we've done, uh, there are presuppositional tendencies there too. Uh, think about Irenaeus, focusing on scripture as the rule of faith. Think about Tertullian, saying that if you don't accept the rule of faith, you shouldn't even participate in the dialogue. And Tertullian saying, what does Jerusalem have to do with Athens? What does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? A lot of that is presuppositional. I think Augustine and Anselm, who taught that uh, uh, I believe in order that I might understand, not the other way around, that is a presuppositional theme. And I think that Thomas Aquinas, uh, although he's one of uh, Van Til's uh, main examples of the bad kind of apologetics, I think Thomas Aquinas was uh, thinking of causality and teleology and, and so on in uh, Christian terms, in biblical terms. But certainly uh, uh, there, there has been a lot of development over the years. It's taken, taken us a long time. I think probably Van, with Van Til and, uh, and uh, planting a Clark, uh, uh, some others like Carnell and so on, the, the, the 20th century is the first century that's really talked about a distinctive Christian epistemology a uh, distinctive Christian theory of knowledge. And that, that I think, is a real advancement uh, in Christian philosophy. Well, Van Til wants to replace the traditional method with what he calls the presuppositional method. And the presuppositional method is, frankly, to deny intellectual autonomy and presuppose God's revelation as the ultimate standard of truth. Secondly, to insist that God's revelation is indeed the only source of meaning and rationality in the world. And then thirdly, to argue transcendentally. I haven't used that word very much with you. I used it when we were talking about Immanuel Kant. Kant uh, 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 took up the tr what he called the transcendental method which is different from rationalism, it's different from empiricism. The transcendental method tries to determine what the world must be like if knowledge is possible, or what are the conditions that make knowledge possible. And Van Til basically uses that kind of method in developing his own apologetics. Sometimes he calls it transcendental method, sometimes he calls it presuppositional method. Uh, and so uh, to argue transcendentally is to show that the truth of Scripture is the very condition of meaningfulness and rationality. That is, it's not just that uh, the biblical worldview is the condition for causality or teleology or something like that, uh, but the biblical worldview must be true if there's to be any meaning in the world, if there's to be any uh, rational argument, if there's to be any beauty, if there's to be any order, any structure, and to deny this leads always to chaos and irrationality, what Van Til used to call chaos and old night. Well, uh, uh, we're just about at the end here, and I have a few questions about uh, the distinctiveness of transcendental argument uh, I, I defend transcendental argument, but you can read my paper on that subject. I think I've, uh, uh, I've assigned it for this course. If I haven't, then look at uh, my website, uh, framepoithrus.org, uh, and uh, read the uh, little article there called Transcendental Arguments. There, there has been some, art, some debate among uh, us Vantillians about the precise nature of transcendental argument. I think it's possible to include evidences as part of transcendental argument. I think it's possible to include causal arguments as part of transcendental argument. I don't think causal arguments take you as far as you need to go, uh, but I think causal arguments can be one 
uh, way of, uh, uh, of uh, coming to the transcendental conclusion. But anyway, that's the uh, end of my lecture series. And uh, I, I trust that uh, you're all clapping there in front of your, uh, in front of your computers. And uh, I hope that it's been a good experience for you. Uh, certainly, uh, we've uh, tried to make it so. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, I hope you have enjoyed the course, and I hope it will be a blessing uh, to you in your uh, ministry and your studies and in your witnessing to people uh, and in your further uh, preparation for gospel uh, ministry. Uh, thanks very much, and may God be with you.